When I was trying to add in some features to the game I've been working on on a live stream, one of the comments I got was someone was trying to contribute, but he felt that the code base has gotten too large that he wouldn't even know where to start. And so I want to kind of give you some tips of how you can jump into a larger code base. This one's not even that big. It's about 27,000 lines of TypeScript. You can actually calculate the number of lines in a package by running C lock. I think you can brew install this and basically point it to some type of glob. So packages slash source or slash app and also exclude the node modules. And that is the, if I did this correct, that's the current lines of code, which is pretty small in the grand scheme of things because the project I work on at work is about 500,000 lines of code. So it's a little higher in complexity, but if you're a beginner seeing all these different folders and these, you know, this mono repo structure with these different game packages and stuff, it can be a little bit overwhelming. So what are the tips I would recommend doing? Now, the first step I would recommend, especially in this day and age with AI, is you should be asking questions. So go to cursor and ask mode. If you have Claude code, ask questions over your code base and try to get some understanding of where you can kind of dive in. Now you might think this is like a marketing video for cursor. It's not like this is actually a feature that I think everyone should be using now in their code base. And that is generating diagrams from the LLM. So for example, if I want to understand how the networking kind of works between the front end and the back end, one thing that you can try doing is say, can you please generate me a mermaid diagram that diagrams out how the client in the back end communicate and list out the most necessary classes or modules or components so I have a good understanding of the web sockets and how they're initialized and how the events are sent over. Okay, so something like this, you can go ahead and kick off a prompt and usually this will generate you a mermaid graph that you can then look over directly inside a cursor is gonna preview it for you hopefully. Um, but we can actually do stuff like this and take time to actually ask questions over your code base. The better you understand the code base, the more you're going to be able to contribute to the code base and the more productive you're going to be. Okay, so the first thing I would probably do is generate a diagram like this. So I can go ahead and just full screen this thing. And we're going to try to dive in to some of these components. So diving into the client side, it looks like there's an initialization box and it looks like there's a game scene which calls a connect to server, which then calls a game client which creates a client event listener. And that's, I guess, listening for events that come in from the WebSocket on the back end, right? And so this client event listener registers handlers on the client socket manager. Okay, and so as you're kind of reading through this, it's probably a good idea to be like, okay, let's make sure I understand this. Let's load up the game client. So I'm gonna go ahead and just collapse this again. Let's say game client. Okay, and then somewhere here, there's calling a client event listener. So client event listener, oh, there it is. Connect the server, there's the function that we talked about. So if you wanna kind of dive backwards, let's figure out what calls connect the server. Let's just go ahead and look at the things that might call this. It looks like there's a game scene init method. So when you log in and you you know enter your username and click play, it looks like it goes to the game, which connects to the server, and then it tries to actually start the game. So looking at this, what does the connect the server method do? Well, it makes a client event listener after it makes a client socket manager. So this is where it's actually connecting to the remote server's web socket URL. And then it uses that socket manager and it starts binding event listeners. So right here, client event listener. And then it does some other stuff down here, but again, like you probably don't care about this. You're just caring about the, the sockets and how that's all initialized. Okay, so let's dive into the client event listener and try to understand what this is doing. Okay, so there is a bunch of event handlers that get bound to the socket manager. So as these events come in from the server, we call different stuff on the client. So for example, when someone is hurt, I do believe we like play a hurt sound on the person's client. Uh, we can also check out some other events here. So gun empty, I think we play like a gun empty sound, loot, zombie attacked, game over. There are certain things we display on the screen when that happens. So we have all these events that are being sent over from the server and just using a diagram like this can help you figure out where to even start, right? So whatever you're trying to do, whether it's a bug fix or you're trying to implement a new feature, I would probably start with asking an LLM to generate some type of graph on the fly so you have a good starting point. So let's actually um, dive into one more example of this in action because I do think this is a really, really important thing to understand. So one more good example I wanna dive into is let's say you wanna contribute to this game and you're like, I don't know where to start. There's just too much code. I don't know even know how to dive into anything. Pick something smaller. How do you add a new item to this game? So for example, we have a pistol here and we have some pistol ammo in R. And when you aim and click somewhere on the screen, notice that it fires a bullet, okay? So let's actually try to dive into how this might be working. Now, the first suggestion I would give, if the code is well architected and stuff is named properly, the first thing you should probably be able to do is look up pistol. 
Okay, it looks like there's two pistol things. There's one on the front end, and there's also one on the back end. So you can kind of load these things up. You can also search server space pistol or client space pistol if you want to kind of isolate down to where that thing is living in which package. Let's just go ahead and open up the, the pistol on the server. Again, this is like pretending like we don't know how any of this stuff works. How would you dive in to maybe make a weapon that's also very similar? So start reading through this and you realize that, okay, there's a pistol class that extends a weapon. Okay, so if you want to add a new weapon, I probably should just like copy and paste this and modify it in some way. So it's like uh, kind of following the same patterns as the pistol. Oh, look, there's a grenade launcher. There's a flamethrower. There's an AK-47. So it looks like we already found where in the code base, a weapons folder that defines how these weapons kind of work, right? So then I would recommend if you just scroll through the code, Oh, look, there's an attack method. Okay, so let's kind of dive into the attack method. What is this doing? It looks like there's a weapon you can call attack on it. It tries to get the player who fired the weapon. And then it goes and it looks for pistol ammo inside of their inventory and it consumes one. And then it broadcasts a gun empty event if they don't have any ammo. And then finally, we make a bullet. So we'll make a new bullet entity. We set the position of the bullet to match the current player's position and then it looks like we angle the bullet so again depending on where you're pointing at we need to actually have the bullet fly in a certain x y velocity right so that's where this is kind of happening so if there is an aim angle defined then we can just use it otherwise we're going to use the facing direction of the player to fire the bullet and i think this is an old legacy code like before we used to shoot bullets by going left right up down and you could only shoot in those directions but recently i added the ability to shoot bullets at the mouse cursor so this is something new and i would assume that there's something calling this attack method which we'll dive into in just a second okay so it looks like we also set a an id on the bullet so we know who shot it we add that entity to some type of entity manager so that gets it into the system so it's going to update every server tick and then we broadcast a event saying that hey a player attacked okay so that's an overall idea and flow of how like the the pistol kind of works right and you can actually start looking at other classes as well like let's look at the ak it probably follows almost an identical set of steps when in fact it actually is this is basically identical code and i would probably even prompt ai to like refactor this into some type of reusable um, attack method when it deals with weapons that shoot projectiles or we can make a new subclass of like a projectile weapon we won't get into that so now let's say you want to figure out okay well what actually calls this attack method like how do i know when i click my mouse button to have the player actually shoot the bullet so what you can do is you can click on this and say go to references and at the very top there's a player object and you'll see a weapon entity dot attack hmm, let's go ahead and just explore that right just exploring the code base is also a good way to understand how it kind of works so there's a handle attack method on the player entity on the server side. So it kind of makes sense that maybe this code is where the relevant stuff happens for when a user clicks their mouse. So you can kind of scroll through here and kind of read through this. It looks like there's a cooldown, so we can only fire a certain amount of times every second. And then I would just continue reading through the code, right? If the input.fire is not set, then we can return. So I'm assuming that the player has some type of like giant map of all the inputs they have down okay look we have the dx the dy that's like the velocity that they're moving in we have an input flag for if they're firing if they're trying to drop an item if they're consuming an item if they're sprinting if they're interacting so at this point it should slowly start to make a little bit more sense as to like how some of the stuff is happening it may take a couple of passers or truly understand it but i guess what i'm trying to show you is that sometimes just exploring the code and just trying to take it apart piece by piece will put you in a good situation to really understand how it's all kind of set up. Okay, so when someone is firing, we get the active weapon. If they don't have one, we just go ahead and return early. And then it looks like we actually create an entity from an item. I'm kind of unaware what this is doing. Uh, so I'm actually gonna highlight this code and I would paste it into the chat panel and we can actually let the LLM kind of explain it to us. So, so why are we creating an entity from an item? It's because the active weapon, I believe is just like a string. Um, it's not an actual like class yet. So if you go to get active weapon, it's literally just like an interface that has a item type and some state on it. So it seems like when we do an attack, we have to new up an entity so we know the logic of how the entity kind of works. I will say that this might need it to do, clean this up. This feels bad and unperformant. Something feels wrong about this, that we have to new up an entity every single time you attack. And that's normal, right? When you're coding and you're kind of like trying to understand something, you might see something that doesn't make sense. Go leave a comment. Or if you're doing like an agentic coding workflow, then prompt AI to kind of refactor this for you. It'll help you design a better way. 
Okay, there's also some hard-coded logic about throwing a grenade. This also feels like a code smell. Uh, this to do this feels like a code smell. Move it out. Okay, we shouldn't know about the grenade here. We should just know about the entity that we're trying to fire. I really wouldn't think handle attack should like have this instance of grenade. It feels kind of weird. Uh, so I would probably spend some time refactoring this too. But the point, if you keep scrolling, eventually you'll get to this right here. Okay, so if you are able to fire based on the cooldown, we do weapon entity dot attack. And this is where it's going to actually call that pistol dot attack method that we kind of talked about. Okay, so the player eventually is going to get the pistol from their inventory. They're going to call attack. It's going to pass in some information about where the player is, what angle they're facing. Um, and then it's going to shoot the pistol and create a bullet and add that to the entity manager. So even though this code may be a little bit confusing to you, but then eventually you'll get to the parts where you actually care about. And it's like, okay, this is where we are letting the player attack. Okay. So hopefully with that overview, you kind of understood, like maybe you don't understand the code base, but you can at least try to pinpoint how certain things are done. Here's another example. We have the mini map. You're curious how the mini map kind of works. Maybe you can go and do a command P and say mini. Oh, look at there. There's a file called mini map. Okay. And then you can read through here. Honestly, I probably wouldn't because there's a lot of like hard coded logic for drawing circles and squares and stuff. But the overall idea is that there's probably a render method on it. Okay, there it is. And so when the client does its render updates, it is basically going to try to render out this minimap. Okay, so you can try to read through this and try to understand how it all works. But overall, it basically just does a 2D loop over some type of 2D array. And then it renders little colored squares based on if the item is you know, a cloth, if it's a weapon or if it's a zombie, there's going to be red. If it's a player, it's going to be green. And then we also have these, these special indicators for special biomes that kind of show up. And then also we have some crates that show up as well. Okay, look, there's a full map panel. Where do you think you'd go in the code base to figure that out? Let's just type map. And there's a full screen map. We can check this out. And again, this has all the code for rendering out that full screen map. Okay, so if you want to tweak something in the full screen map, and maybe you want to go through here and allow someone to click and drag the map so that we can actually get a bigger view. Because right now you can only zoom in and zoom out, but there's a lot of the map that we can't see because you can't drag it around. So maybe that's something you want to add in. Maybe you want to make the map a little bit larger because right now we can't see the bottom or the top of the map. So making this have a little bit higher height, maybe giving it more width. Could be useful i don't know maybe you don't want to block your health because that could be really problematic if you're getting attacked and you don't know it but i guess the point i'm trying to get at is that no matter how much code there is you can usually find an entry point into the feature that you're trying to figure out even if you're not doing game development and you're doing web development typically you can find the page that's responsible for you know showing that table and then you can find the component that's responsible for rendering out the table with like a sortable column header. And then you can find the API endpoint that's responsible for fetching that data from the backend. And then you can go and dive into the API endpoint, look at the logic and try to understand how does authentication work? How does the ORM, if you're using one, how does it fetch data from the database? What schema is responsible for showing all this data on the table, okay? So I know I'm kind of rambling a lot in this video, but I guess I just wanted to kind of throw that your way in case you guys are curious about how do you actually dive into a code base that's a little bit larger because it could be a little bit daunting. It could be a little bit scary, but trust me, if you just find one little thing to chip away on and then slowly expand your knowledge base around that thing and you do that every day, soon you start understanding how the entire code base kind of works. And then at some point, all the dots will kind of connect and then you'll realize that the code that you're looking at is actually just a bunch of garbage written by Web Dev Cody. Okay. Okay. So hopefully you guys enjoy my little tips and tricks with using the LLM to generate graphs and also using the LLM to ask questions. I do this all the time. Sometimes you forget about the code you wrote and it's important to be able to remind yourself using the LLM. The great thing about the LLM is that it gives you the latest up-to-date documentation on your code. So now instead of having MD files that get old and stale, you can ask questions about your current to-date state of code and get a pretty accurate response, dare I say. Now we all know on YouTube, a video is not complete unless the creator plugs his own course platform. So go to agenticjumpstart.com. There is a mailing list. You can go ahead and enter your information. And when I finish this course, I will let you guys know and I'm going to teach you all about agentic coding, everything I know about cursor and Claude code. I've been using agentic coding for a very long time to build out this game and many other web applications and also on my full-time jobs. I have been basically leveraging LLMs a lot to make my productivity 
skyrocket. So definitely go check out my course if you're interested in becoming a better developer by using AI to 10x your skills. Other than that, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. I tried to up up the energy a little bit in my video to see if it's more engaging. But yeah, hope you guys enjoyed. Have a good day and happy coding.